everybody, welcome back to the Study Tube project. Today you are with me, Rosie, and I'm a recent graduate of the University of Oxford, currently on a gap year. I work in a school, so I'm at home at the moment, and I wanted to share some of my expertise that I've learned at uni with you. During my degree, I wrote over 120 essays. I know. <laughs> And what that has meant is that I've got quite good at it, I'm not gonna lie. Before we begin, I need a few things from you guys, one of which is a thumbs up if you like this sort of content, so like the revision stuff, the essay stuff, whether you want more of our favourite revision techniques and how we personally do essays and lecture notes because everyone is different. Number two is to drop me a comment giving any form of feedback but also most importantly an area of archaeology that you would like to know more about. So any period of history or area of the world that you would like to know more about, maybe you don't know anything about it and you just think I'd quite like to learn something. I don't care what it is but I'd like to know something. I want to know so drop me a comment. This video is going to be in two parts and the second part is going to be on my own channel purely because I think this will end up being too long and too full on to do in one video and I don't want to bombard the Study Tube Projects channel with just me. In this half we are going to be covering the pre-reading, the planning and structure points, how to make sure your structure is high level. In the second half, which will be up at 6.30 on my channel, so you can go straight to it if you want to, we will be covering the main body writing, including the introduction and conclusion, and the references. So let's get started. Reading of your essay is going to be the most time consuming part of the essay by a mile, I can guarantee it. If you are writing GCSE and A level essays you will still have to do pre-reading but that will probably come from textbooks, your resources and any form of revision or lesson work that you've done. At university it's going to be more complex than that, you'll have to use online journals, books from libraries. If you haven't got access to a library then don't panic, there are online book depositories. Google Scholar, Google Books also has at least most of the pages of a lot of books that you can access and you're not going to have to read the whole book anyway. So even if you can only access a few pages including the introduction and conclusion then you're on your way. When you are doing your pre-reading the hardest part is actually selecting relevant information. So say this was on my reading list. She thick. My reading list from my degree also looks something like this, it's on the screen now and there are a lot of books on there, you know, sometimes up to 16 books and at least 7 have a star which suggests that we really need to focus on that and read it. There's usually three key texts and a load of case studies. I would assume that any other university's reading list will be the same as this, but if each book on that list looks like this, what do you do? The first thing you should do is check your essay question. Now if your essay question has any keywords in it whatsoever, for example the one I've got on the screen, the keywords are origins, isotopes, and basically what we can learn from isotopes. So what we need to do there is explore which isotopes we have to look up. We need to explore what origins means, whether there's a definition we can find, and go from there. If my question was how can we sex and age skeletons from the pelvis and the skull, if you don't know, check out my video on the Solid Tube Project, link to the pinned comment. But if I was just going to do it from this book, I would have to look in the introduction, because this book is massive, see if there is anything in here. <laughs> anthropological estimation of sex and age, woo! -hoo. So page 201, we'd go there, there we have it. So we've then got a chapter, she's still pretty thick, but this is when we look at the introduction, conclusion and abstract. With these, they can be really wordy, sometimes they're very difficult to navigate. A technique I use in order to actually find the information that I want, because quite often you read an article that has been put on your reading list and you're just thinking, what am I meant to take from it? And in those cases I use Control F, that's on my Windows laptop, 
I would assume that it's the same on a Mac, but I don't know. Basically what it does is it finds specific words in the text and there might be six incidences of the word you can search through and it lets you go straight from one to the next. You can search whole sentences if you want and it just means that it's so much quicker and easier to locate the actual relevant information for your essay. Don't be tempted to skip through an abstract either because it might seem like you're just going to have to read it in the text anyway so there's no point reading it but the abstract is written to draw people in and to set out the main argument and sometimes the main conclusion so I would read it because it can help your understanding of what the actual thing is trying to tell you about. Another key section of an article that you should read is the discussion. If you've read the introduction and you kind of understand the basic concept of what they're trying to find out, the discussion of an article, particularly science articles or social science articles, will lay out the key findings and also discuss critiques. The intro will bring in any wider reading that you might want to continue with and, you know, look deeper into, but the discussion will, like, explode that. Like, if you don't want to look through the results, I don't blame you, or the methods, it is the discussion, the conclusion, and the introduction that are the key areas to read, and most papers will have them. I set out my pre-reading like so, I simply put the title of the piece and then add all of my reading, but then go back over it before I actually write and separate it into like more coherent sections <laughs> because sometimes articles just don't flow how you want them to. Which leads me in to my plan. I never used to plan, um, I didn't used to plan. The first, first term of university I didn't plan A-levels, started to a little bit but not really, just didn't see the point of taking extra time to plan as opposed to doing the actual question that was being asked of me, which is not going to work for you in the long run, especially not a university. If you have a flair for writing naturally, then that might carry you through at GCSE, but at A-level and university you need to plan in order to get the top grades. Planning includes working out what the question's actually trying to ask of you, so exploding the question, highlighting keywords, highlighting the command word is really important. So if it says discuss, evaluate, compare, contrast, analyse, assess, you need to explode those. I keep saying explode, but in my mind that's what I do, I kind of draw lines off it and try and deduce what it's actually asking of me because there is no point moving on to the next step without actually really understanding what the question wants you to do. And you might interpret that differently to other people and that is okay as long as you present a whole answer that's backed up and flows. The first thing I do when I'm planning is do it on my actual paper. So I've got all of my reading in a big long list on a Word document, but then on an actual physical notepad, I will put the question in the middle and then mind map it but it doesn't have to be in mind map, it could literally be like notes. My brain just works better with mind mapping because I can link things together and just put it wherever I want on the page, basically. <laughs> I'm a messy thinker. A first plan or mind map that you do might simply have the different text that you've read off and then next to the text you put what points you could bring out of it. But then if you do like another one after that, which has the central bit and then the key points, with evidence coming out of the key points because when you actually write your essay you want it to be based off the key points not the texts. The text should be your evidence and the P should be the main part of the paragraph. So if you think back to your P paragraphs, I know we did those at GCSE and A-level so I'm sure you probably have two. You've got point, evidence, explain or analysis depending on how you have written your P. <laughs> the same stands at degree except it's a little bit more complex. You can use this structure to then plan further. I know this seems like a lot of planning, but believe me, it will really help with your structure and your actual flow of argument and it will end up making a massive difference to how well your argument is put together. We're always talking from experience on this channel, so learn from my mistakes. Doing a table might seem horrible, I used to hate 
the idea of that. It was just not something that appealed to me. But if you make a table which has your point in one column, what paper backs this up in another column, critique of that paper or someone else that agrees with it in another, and then perhaps your opinion in the final column, which is just like a what this suggests is, I would argue that a critique might be from you. It might be you saying, well, this is actually outdated a newer source is this and they have a different idea of what is right maybe they actually agree I don't know it really depends what your essay is on once you've done your table and you've kind of organized your key points so you know what texts match what argument I do a flow chart not every time I can't lie and say I've used it every time but I have used it for some and it has really helped so the introduction will be in the top one I'll try and draw it out on screen the top one will be in the the introduction and then you'll work out what's going to go next you could do different shapes so you could have a square for a point a diamond for a critique a circle for your opinion it just means that when you come to write it you know exactly what order it's going to be in and it flows because it's a flow chart yeah if you have gone to this much detail in your plan writing your essay will be worlds worlds so much easier is what i was trying to say what just happened to my brain writing will be much much quicker if you have done a plan because it just removes the confusion about what you're doing next i found a lot of the time when i had a really short deadline because we were writing two essays a week so if i had three days to write an essay often i would reduce the time planning and try and just put that into writing but it just it doesn't really work i still did it over and over again but it doesn't work as a technique and on my masters we're gonna plan everything <laughs> of course you will probably find small extra things along the way when you're writing and that is okay don't worry about slotting things in on your plan just make sure that you go back do a second draft and assess the structure is how you want it and that it still flows and still forms a coherent argument. On that we come to structure tips. Woo! Your essay should flow like a river. Ooh. No. In fact the whole process is like a river because the planning and the research is like the little tributaries and then you get to the main river and then the conclusion it's your C. Now some key structure points to make your essay flow is that the start of each paragraph should introduce the argument in that section. I can hand on heart say I did not do this in enough of my essays and the better essays that I made did do this. They put forward exactly what I wanted to say in the first line which is what you do in a P paragraph. So really, we don't want to be uh, reverting backwards with our university essays. They need to still have the P structure. Your teachers are correct. What you need to make sure is that this line also links somehow with the previous paragraph. Now, I'm going to put my uh, master's application just on the screen because although it's not an essay essay, I did do this linking thing quite well, if I do say so myself, <laughs> I was quite proud of it. What you can see then is that I've tried my absolute best to join each section so that it does flow and it is, you know, it makes sense. It's written in an order that is obvious, it's not really fragmented, which is what my brain actually felt like in reality. This essay on rituals that I've got on the screen now is also a really good example of where I've kind of introduced my argument properly in each paragraph. My tutor enjoyed this essay and I quite like writing it, you know, because when you have an introductory sentence, it does make you feel like you know what you're doing. Instead of just going into a paragraph like a headless chicken, you have a head and you're crossing the road What? One thing that really, really helped me when writing essays was using subtitles. Now, I did not know until far too late that this was an acceptable thing to do, but it is. <laughs> Don't go wild. Make sure they're relevant, but subtitles 
do allow you to be a bit less flowy, especially when your essay has got quite different sections. So as you can see here in my isotopes essay, I have got provenance isotopes, dietary isotopes, you know, the introduction, and then also a second part of the essay which discusses it. It needed to be joined in some way, and the only way that I could really do that was with subtitles. Again, in this paleodemography essay about the pelvis and the skull, we can see all of the different subtitles. I just feel like they really help even if you get rid of them in the end when you're writing it if you have a subtitle you know what it is you're talking about it just helps a peace of mind and can make your writing much more direct and concise and just essentially get your argument over with instead of skirting round right that is it for the video on this channel because i'm aware it's already been a long time <laughs> Head over to my channel at 6.30 and you can find part two of the video. I hope so far has helped you and if you think that is enough then fair enough. Go enjoy your day or watch the second half at another time. It is completely up to you but just make sure in the comments you do let me know which areas of archaeology you want to learn about and like this video if you were enjoying like the essay uh, revision and tips kind of things because they're a little bit different to academic teaching but if that's what you want then that's what you want thank you for watching and thank you for bearing with us at this time you know a lot of the group have exams a lot of the group are just starting up a university term again and it is getting really really difficult we're all facing uncertainty as you are and some of us have more time than others because we've graduated but it it's getting it's getting difficult we're not losing heart we still absolutely love this project you know all of everything that we raise from this is going to charity so we're not going to stop anytime soon we're loving it we just need to find our own pace i think really um that's going to keep us healthy and you happy because it's just we want you guys to be happy yeah <laughs> now go over to my channel <laughs>